Hello and welcome to Fully Charged. Rivian. It is the name that everybody is talking about in the automotive industry. What is Rivian? Well, we decided to go and find out. Well, I say we, I meant Chelsea Sexton really, because she lives a little bit closer to America than Robert and me. And if you can't wait to see this car in the metal, we are delighted to confirm that it will be on display at Fully Charged Live USA in February 2020. Let's start with a bit of background. Okay. What made you want to do an electric car? So I'm a lifelong car enthusiast. And when I first started the business, we were doing a different type of product. It was, it was more of a sports car. And we worked on that for like two and a half years. Mm -hmm. So from like middle of 2009 till end of 2011. And the problem with the product, and we increasingly could really feel it, and we really knew it in our hearts, was it wasn't really answering uh, this core question, why do, we, why do we exist? Why does the world need this company to right. exist? And so we shelved that product at the end of 2011 and began to transition to what you see today. Mm -hmm. So essentially developing a portfolio of products on a common platform. But for Rivian branded products, uh, all of these vehicles really aligning with the idea of active lifestyles. So products that enable, you know, you carry your kids, your gear, your whether it's a surfboard or a golf bag or a fishing pole, all your stuff yep. uh, to whatever your adventure is. Um, it could be the theme park or it could be the beach or it could be the stream. And that naturally led us to selecting as segments, the truck and the SUV segment as, as launch segments to go into. Yeah. Um, but as we built out the organization, the, the platform that those vehicles sit on was also designed to have applications well beyond our own brand. Mm -hmm. And importantly, it was designed such that you could dial up or dial down performance for these different types of applications. So the, the recent announcement we had with Amazon where we're taking our battery, our drivetrain, our cooling system, all of our connected vehicle architecture, our ECU net, uh, architecture, and applying it to such a different vehicle segment was actually part of the plan since, since the very, very early days. Oh, um, interesting. We were just very quiet about how we went about it, so we didn't um, sort of state any of that you know, early on, but that was, that was abs absolutely part of it. You're in charge of one or two things related to this truck. Oh, I yeah. care about what it's going to be like to drive, but you have more than that. Yeah, so I'm, I'm the chief engineer for the, for the whole program, but I do actually chiefly care about how it drives and that kind of customer interaction. Yeah. The goal from the very start is really around what we determine to be a, a kind of customer that we think exists and no one's playing to today. So clean sheet of paper, how do we just do it better? In general, and this is the case with all EVs, you've got your battery pack at the bottom yep. and you've got your powertrains like in between the wheels. So it's a really wonderful setup to get a great dynamic performance. So the the very outset, you kind of package everything right down the bottom. You create these wonderful, like extra benefit environments, yeah. like the like the frunk. Um, <laughs> it holds three people, I think. Yeah, three. Like I could curl <laughs> I've up. I've never and seen sleep. three people in that, but maybe. I'll demonstrate. <laughs> <laughs> but regardless, you get this you get this wonderful kind of um, low center of gravity, yep. and we can manipulate things in such a way that we kind of focus on getting uh, your weight distribution right for dynamic. Uh, perspective. So you were talking about choosing things to vertically integrate versus not. Mm. What are some some examples of what you really want to hold on to as proprietary <laughs> versus partnering or, sure. or vending or whatever? So uh, we own, when you think about the, the vehicle, what we call skateboard or platform, yep. um, the battery, the drivetrain, the integration of those into a, into a drive platform, uh, we own all of that. So the battery, we take a, a cell, a cylindrical cell from a from a supplier. We haven't announced two, but there's there's a handful of suppliers. But it's a 2170. That, it's a 2170 yeah. cell, yeah. so 21 millimeters in diameter, 70 millimeters in height. Um, we take those cells and we do everything north of that. So we integrate those cells into modules, like that module sitting right there. <laughs> and those modules then go into packs, and then of course the pack goes into the vehicle. And then we do all the control systems on top of that. Now, in addition to battery, we do the integration of our drive system. So mm -hmm. we do the, the gearbox, motor assembly to gearbox, the power electronics, so the inverter, all in-house design, and then the controllers, the ECUs for that uh, system we do in-house. And then all of the network architecture, essentially the digital layer within the vehicle, mm -hmm. um, we brought in and do from the chips north 
we do all those ECUs. And the reason for that is we wanted to have really precise and full control of the data layer within the vehicle. Sure, yeah. So you know, the easy things you get out of that are things like an over-the-air update. So it makes it very easy for us to, to send you know, new suspension control parameters to the vehicle. And, but more importantly, allows us to create features that don't normally exist or are very hard to yeah. uh, put together. So, so OTA is planned, sort of, oh, of course. out of the gate. Yeah, yeah. It's like, uh, it's table stakes. <laughs> um, but beyond OTA, I mean, think about if you have motors that you can control torque on individually each wheel, yep. uh, dampers that you can adjust on a you know corner by corner basis, uh, roll control that you can adjust front to back differently. All these different things connect in a really um, tight fashion. Yep. So by us owning and, and driving all the controllers, all the ECUs, and all those ECUs sitting on an Ethernet backbone, it allows us to. Um, not only manage the data that comes off the vehicle, but also very proactively control the vehicle with a set of knobs that you wouldn't normally have access to. So, yeah. so from a software point of view, it just gives us uh, infinite Quite levels a bit of, of an control. advantage, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The other, the other big benefit of the EV platform, and this is quite particular to the, R, the R1, and uh, what we're doing at Rivian that is not replicated by, as far as I know, any other manufacturer today, we have four uh, individual powertrains, right? So yep. we have an uh, electric motor for each wheel, mm -hmm. not mounted in the wheel, but mounted inboard, yeah. with the gearbox, so a single speed gearbox for each motor um, mounted inboard as far as we can. Yeah. And the idea being that we get a really long half shaft mm -hmm. to enable this big articulation. Because they're four separate motors, you can then drive the torque individually per wheel exactly how you want. Yeah. Uh, including, and this gets talked about a lot, but including in the opposite direction to achieve things like tank turn. Yeah. Right? Um, tank turn is a feature that is something we are working deeply on and is kind of dependent on the wheelbase mm -hmm. around how, how good that performance is. And we're trying to make it a very custom usable feature. Um, at the moment, it's likely to be the shorter wheelbase versions that are going to see that. Yeah, right? okay. It's, um, but it's a fantastic feature and it doesn't have to just deliver a tank turn. There's a lot of benefits that lead up to this kind of super tight turn that we can still deliver. So uh, one of the best features of this vehicle as a whole, like dynamically, because you start with this low center of gravity, um, we have targeted a low polar moment of inertia as much as we can, so bring the masses toward the, the center of the vehicle. Uh, but then we can do perfect torque vectoring. Mm -hmm. So when you, if you want to change the agility of the car uh, on top of its basic kind of dynamic setup, which is just basically the, the wheelbase of the vehicle and uh, you know, your tires, your, your suspension setup, how the kinematics work. On, to on top of that, we can then use the torque vectoring to create agility. And I've been driving recently some of the latest iterations of that, and yeah. I've driven other torque vectoring uh, implementations, and it's just it just blows my mind with respect to just what a vehicle this size and uh, you know the, considering what it can do off road. I'll go into that in a second. Um, what it does dynamically, just just literally astonishing. It reminds me a little bit of like speed sensitive steering, where it, it self adjusts based on the input. Yes, uh, so the, the torque vectoring is actually the enhancer there. So the yeah. torque vectoring can do two things. It can stabilize the vehicle mm -hmm. as, as you're turning the vehicle in. You, you, sorry, not stabilize, you can make the vehicle more agile as you turn the vehicle in and you kind of play and give this sense that the, the car is much smaller and much more agile than you would expect it to be for, for something like this. And then if you were to over steer it or get into a situation where you're a little bit out of control, torque vectoring also enhances that stability of the, of the vehicle, right? Yeah. And it's quite an incredible change. It's something that um, when you have a heavy car, and you know, it's, this is very light for its segment, and we've done everything we possibly can to, to lighten it, and it's, you know, for, from a vehicle that looks this big, right. it, it's, and with a, with a giant battery, it's, it's incredibly light. In the end, um, quite a performance package, and that's without kind of talking about what we can do in terms of traction. Mm -hmm. And then traction control is like a whole nother field, right? right. Um, and that's basically optimizing the slip of the wheel with respect to the road. Yeah. So depending on the surface that you're on, the mu, um, basically the grip or whether the surface is deformable or not deformable, you can adjust the slip of the tire in order to optimize the performance of the tire. Um, because we have an electric motor, we can use the, uh, the knowledge of the um, 
current going into that motor to estimate the torque. Mm -hmm. And it's far more accurate than estimating the torque uh, and with an internal combustion engine. That's basically a big model of like injection and firing yeah. and all sorts of timing. And it's, 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 it's never that accurate. And what's more is you then have this single source of torque that you're trying to then calculate what the torque looks like at each wheel. In our case, we know very accurately what the torque is at that wheel. And so because we know the torque, we can optimize it immediately and we can, we can determine how much torque is getting us, how much acceleration and how much slip. Mm -hmm. So we know the mu. And that means that we can optimize the slip of the wheel and like perfectly not perfectly, but very, very close <laughs> to perfectly, for the tire and for the, for the grip that we have available. So if you take the off-road scenario, um, with an internal combustion engine, if you, if you lose grip at any one wheel, you usually have to recover that yeah. wheel using the brake or right, something like yeah. that. Or, and, then, and then you back off the torque of the engine and it's all a bit slow and it's got this long feedback loop. It's a little clumsy sometimes, yeah. It's quite, yeah, <laughs> clumsy is an understatement. I, I spent a long time developing exactly those systems and kind of frustratingly, that was the, that was the constraint. In this scenario, it's, it's amazing. And because it's so, so fast, that feedback loop, it's also imperceptible to the driver. So mm -hmm. you have this incredible wheel control. And what that means off-road is that you can utilize the grip way, way better. Well, we're sitting in this cool thing. Take me through some of the features that folks can look forward to. Well, you are looking at, so in front of you is the, the cluster. Mm -hmm. It's in a demo mode now. So yeah. what you're seeing is a demo mode showing it when it's in an off-road condition. But this is mostly your driver display. And then the center screen here, this is all of your user input inputs. Yeah, it seems like there's, there's an interesting screen philosophical debate going on right now of mm. how, how much screen versus how many knobs and all of those. You, you have chosen much screen, no knobs. <laughs> yeah, the, the nice thing about having everything in screens, like what you see here, um, is it's completely flexible. Mm -hmm. So there's, we're not locking ourselves into any specific set of parameters. Right. Um, and because the vehicles will get better you know, over time, yep. It allows us to launch new features really quickly and really easily. Um, whereas if it had knobs that were <clears throat> sort of hardwired in, right. it would make it much harder for us to say, hey, here's a new feature yes. uh, that knob you <laughs> used to use is no longer needed. One of the reasons I actually joined Rivian is because uh, during my interview process, we talked about the battery design. And I had some experience with battery design in the past, and so I know about a lot of the failure modes, and they, they concern me. When, when we looked at the module design, I immediately had this kind of light bulb moment thinking, this is perfect for, like, the, because we have a large format vehicle, um, we can be a little bit creative about what we do. We don't have to have a module that's this thick, right? right. We can have something that's a little bit bigger. And that module is designed to be rackable. It's also designed to cool the cells actually. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of applications, uh, I won't name any names, but most, <laughs> most EV applications that use the cylindrical cell like yep. ours, they tend to cool the cell radially, right? Uh, which, is, which isn't bad, but actually cooling the cell actually, the studies that we, sh we, we did showed that we can easily cool the cell actually and then fit significantly more cells in this space. Mm -hmm. So volumetric and gravimetric efficiency goes up considerably. For sure. Um, and you have a cold plate that's kind of sandwiched between those cells. Uh, the result is that you know, you, you can, we can fit more power per space uh, and for the mass um, than anyone else, which is, I mean, that's, that's kind of what we need, right? right. And then the core of that is because we can fit so many cells in, in the vehicle, the C rate that we need to use the pack at is, is quite low. Mm -hmm. So you don't stress the cells like a lot of vehicles might because we have this huge pack. So we, if you want to deliver close to 800 horsepower, which we do, right. then it's not a big strain on the pack. So it sounds like it should be a big strain, but it's, it's not. Yeah, zero to 63 seconds. Yes. But that doesn't really do it justice. What, what makes the vehicle so unique is the, the way that we're able to control torque. Yep you know, between not just front to back, but also left to right mm -hmm. instantaneously, uh, coupled with the ability to adjust the roll stiffness and the damping frequency. Uh, yeah. You can have a vehicle that instantaneously can go from something that's incredible off-road mm -hmm. to something that's incredible on-road. Right. Um, and it doesn't, 
like instantaneously. So yeah. it's um, it's really fun. And I'm and, and similarly charging at any reasonable speed for a pack. I mean, you have three pack sizes. We do. But they yeah. start at 105. 105. And just goes up from there. And 180, I think, is the. Top. That's right. Yeah. So and 135, 135, 135, 180. Yeah. yeah. So you'd have to have some pretty decent charging speed, <laughs> which also creates a lot of heat and is usually the other issue that. That's right. That um, ultimately, the charging speed for us is limited by the charge uh, points at, yep. this, at this stage. So right. in the US, um, most of the charges roll, being rolled out are about 150 kilowatts, yep. and this pack easily does that. So yeah. we don't have features today on the show vehicles that show towing, but we've put in a lot of work into the towing packages. You can tow roughly uh, 12,000 pounds, mm -hmm. right? That's how we've specified our towing capability, but that's not the limitation of the powertrain. We could actually tow more, but the, the limitation that we kind of uh, create a requirement for ourselves is around the structure. Mm -hmm. So if we want to tow more, we could with the powertrain, we could with, with right. everything else, but you put too much structure in the, in the, in the truck and then it becomes heavy. And so you yes. have this trade-off and it's yes. like with everything, there's always these trade-offs. Like, do we want to make it heavier and, and do that? Or do we want to make it lighter right. and do that? And we've kind of found this, this bit in the middle where we think we can operate. Yeah, um, well, and because it's EV, you can tow a lot potentially. Like, there's no ever a lack of torque. It's yeah. usually suspension or other components, but also you cut your range in half if you tow enough things. Yeah, something well, big enough. I mean, the reality is you cut your range in half, whether it's internal combustion engine right. or um, For or, sure, or an but EV, it's more obvious it's, and everyone focuses on it for the EVs. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's an argument I'm tired of having. But it I is, know. <laughs> <laughs> The There's advantage is you can regenerate all that power down a really big hill, and then if you're towing something, you can regenerate even more power. Yeah, so sure. Well, and we see quite often, with, especially with startup EV companies, they sort of start at the very high end and work their way down. Yep. So I assume that's some of the intention here, and now a parallel <coughs> path of, of goods movement electrification, which yeah. is a huge category by yeah. itself with yeah. Amazon. So what's the longer term vision? Is it stay at this premium level? or? Well, I think you know we're not just launching a a vehicle, we're also launching a brand. Yep. So when you think about launching a brand and a new company and a new manufacturing system with lots and lots of new technology, uh, it's really important to select the right price points and segments so that you can put all that technology and uh, all the new product into right. something that you can actually make money on. And you know that was how we set up this initial portfolio, these, these first two vehicles. But over time, we have other vehicles in the portfolio that will still be aspirational, still be what we would think of as emotional products, things that you connect yes. with, <laughs> uh, d really desirable products, yep. but in different sizes and at different price points. Vehicles are such an emotional purchase, and everyone assumes with an EV, it's like, no, 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 everyone's so super pragmatic. Yeah. No, they're not. This is an emotional thing. This is cool. <laughs> yeah, so like our, our these, this, we're sitting in the truck now, but the, yeah. the SUVs, really is a lot of shared content. They're both really fun vehicles. You know, the way we always think about it, this shouldn't just be better, uh, you know, because it's electric, it should be better in every way. So yep. we use the new technology, all the connectivity, all the smart architecture uh, to make the car just better in every way mm -hmm. relative to a combustion uh, vehicle. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Fully Charged. Don't forget, if you want to see one of the Rivian vehicles with your own eyes, why not come along to Fully Charged Live USA where they will be on display? If you have been, thank you for watching. <laughs>